The National Broadcasting Company presents Lives of Great Men, a new series on great leaders in human progress, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author of For What Do We Live? and many other books. In his talks, Dr. Griggs will build a story of civilization based on outstanding characters through the ages and how each one influenced his own and future times. This evening, Dr. Griggs will discuss Theodoric, the Great, the Defeated Dream. We present Edward Howard Griggs. My friends, from the overburdened Emperor Marcus Aurelius, saddened by the ruin he could not avert, we turn to one of the most strangely fascinating characters in all history, a barbaric chieftain who became head of the Western Empire, significant enough to be the hero of a medieval saga, Dietrich von Bern, or Theodoric of Verona. This barbarian of the period of folk wandering dreamed a great dream of recovering Roman civilization, uniting it with the new Christian faith, and handing the Union on for the peace and culture of succeeding ages. That great dream was broken by one of those seeming historic accidents that have played so vital a part in the life of mankind. Early in the fourth century, Constantine the Great made Christianity the official religion of the empire and removed the capital to Byzantium, the new Rome on its seven hills by the Bosporus. The hold of Rome was too strong, however, and the Western Empire was revived. Fearing barbaric invasion, in 402 the Emperor Honorius removed the capital to Ravenna, second port of the empire, almost impregnable among its marshes and rivers. To the amazement of mankind, the sack of Rome by Alaric followed in 410, and the Emperor's sister, Gala Placidia, was carried away to Gaul and compelled to marry a barbaric chieftain. After his death and her mistreatment by his successor, ransomed by Honorius, Gala Placidia was brought to Ravenna and married to a Greek noble, and later ruled the Western Empire for the second quarter of the fifth century as regent for her son, Valentinian III. She adorned the city with churches and palaces. Her tomb, the first cruciform structure the interior covered with mosaics like Persian tapestry is the mother of all the cathedrals. Valentinian's death soon came soon after his mother's, and he was followed by a series of shadow emperors, as one historian calls them, each in turn lifted on the shields of the soldiers to a few transient months of power, nine in 21 years. Then in 476, the goth Odovacher made himself master of Italy and the Western Empire had fallen. Odovacher was to be followed by the greatest of all the Goths, the dreamer of the great dream. Theodoric was of the line of Amal kings, ruling the Ostrogoths in the wild country north of Constantinople. The king who was Theodoric's father made peace with the Eastern Emperor and sent his son as royal guest hostage to ensure the contract. Thus, from 7 to 19, Theodoric lived in the emperor's palace. And those 12 years of contact with the highest surviving culture deeply affected him. Constantinople was the meeting place of Greek intellect, Roman law, and Oriental magnificence, all contrasting with the wild, wandering life of Theodoric's tribe. During these years, he must have thought out the plan that was to be his life program. Returning to his tribe and succeeding his father as king, Theodoric resumed for 15 years the barbaric life of his people with no hint of the brooding dream. Then he made a bargain with the Eastern Emperor that if he could conquer Italy, he might rule it in the name of the empire. In 488, he started southwestward over the mountains with his entire tribe, lowing cattle, bleating sheep, rude wagons carrying women and children, armed warriors on foot and horseback, the bizarre spectacle of a folk migration. Descending upon Italy, he quickly took Verona and made it his temporary capital. All northern Italy was soon under his sway, but it took four years of warfare to overcome Odovacher and take Ravenna. The final battle was fought under the umbrella pines along the Adriatic shore. 
and the last barbaric act of Theodoric for thirty years was to lift his great broadsword and cleave in two the captured Odovacher. Theodoric established himself at Ravenna as king of the Goths and Romans in Italy. Though stronger than the Eastern Emperor, he kept faithfully but self-respectingly his promised subordination. Not only was he soon master of all Italy, but through treaties and alliances, he became the supreme power over all that had been the Western Empire, though never assuming the title of emperor. His consistently followed aims were to unite the Goths and Romans in friendly harmony, to recover the Roman culture, law, and order, to unite these with the Christian faith and hand the combination on to the peaceful, ordered life of subsequent generations. What centuries of night and destruction might have been avoided, how different the history of the world would have been could Theodoric's dream have been realized. For a time he achieved it, since he was as great a statesman as warrior. He exercised firm control, but with justice and fairness to all, showing no favoritism and making no distinction between Goths and Romans. He was broadly tolerant, generously humane, and sought to establish an era of universal peace. Without book learning, but with the lasting influence of a dozen years in Constantinople, he was a born leader, wise in his judgment and handling of men. Under Theodoric, Ravenna entered upon her period of glory. The king's vast palace and closing gardens, adorned with mosaics and frescoes and statues, was one of the wonders of the world. Plundered by Charlemagne and others, it has shrunk to the fragment of a wall, and even that is questioned. On the other hand, the stern tomb of Theodoric, built during his lifetime, is well preserved. Erected in a crowded new quarter of the city which had been developed under Theodoric and has now entirely disappeared, the tomb is some distance out from Ravenna. It is surmounted by a single block of Istrian marble, estimated to weigh 475 tons. It gives us some notion of the engineering skill commanded by Theodoric to realize that in the 6th century they could quarry, transport, and lift to the top of the monument such a monolith. The Goths were Arians, and so not of the Orthodox communion for which the previous churches had been built. Therefore, Theodoric had a new court church erected called St. Martin in a Heaven of Gold, so named doubtless from the wealth of gold leaf used in the mosaics and other decorations of the interior. Well preserved is in simple basilica form with a long nave and aisles. The beautiful columns have double capitals, the second flowering into leaves and arabesques from the first of Corinthian type. While violating the restrained harmony of Greek architecture, the effect is of oriental luxuriance. On the inner wall beside the entrance are two mosaics from Theodoric's time, one portraying his palace, the other Ravenna's ancient port of Classis, then with room for 250 warships, now silted up and gone. On the side walls of the nave are two upper series of mosaics, also executed under Theodoric, quaintly but with considerable freedom, portraying storytelling scenes from Christian tradition. Everywhere Christ and the apostles are in childlike fashion, made much larger than the other characters. In the scene representing the casting of devils out of the insane man into the herd of swine, the herd consists of three complacent pigs, swimming away. In a mosaic of the Last Supper, the earliest I know in Christian art, the apostles are crowded together on one side of the table, while the Christ, given a full bearded face, is placed a little apart. Ruskin remarked that the permanence of color in mosaic work makes it especially appropriate for religious decoration. It has another value he did not mention. The very difficulty in execution through using little pieces of colored glass and stone, gives its pictures a restrained dignity peculiarly fitted to religious themes. Childlike as is this art of Ravenna, it is a new art, in striking contrast to that of classic antiquity, making Ravenna indeed the cradle of Christian art. An ancient round structure, probably originally part of a Roman bath, was converted into a baptistry for the Arians. Its central mosaic is the baptism of Jesus, 
The Christ type had not yet become conventionalized, and here the Jesus is a youthful Apollo, while, quaintly enough, the river god Jordan pours out the water for the baptism. In the year 500, Theodoric made a six-month visit to Rome. He was received with acclamation by the populace, who longed to have him return the capital to Rome. Why did he not? He was no longer in need of the protecting barriers about Ravenna. Probably it was his modest subordination to the Eastern Empire, as well as preference for the flourishing capital he had developed and adorned. Theodoric was now at the height of his power, with every promise that his dream would be fulfilled. What broke the dream? Well, several causes united to defeat it. In spite of the loyalty of Theodoric, the Eastern Emperor was jealous of his greater power and seeking an opportunity to oppose him. Then there was the resentment of the Romans, of all native Italians, toward the Goths. The Romans were vastly more numerous with a long cultural tradition, but subject to the barbaric conquering tribe. With all Theodoric's humane tolerance, making no distinction among Goths, Romans, and Jews, and striving to give his own people Latin culture, the Romans continued resentful and chafing. Under these causes was a third, accentuating and uniting them, becoming the hinging center of opposition, the difference in religious belief. This was due to what was relatively an historic accident, the fact that the Goths had been converted to Christianity by a bishop of the Arian faith. The differences between the two beliefs were purely theological, and to our minds not of great importance. The Orthodox held that the Son coexisted with the Father from all eternity. The Arians that the Father created the Son out of nothing at a particular point of time. The Orthodox believed the Son to be of the same substance with the Father. The Arians of like substance. That one little letter distinguishing the two Greek words, the iota, became the rallying point for all elements of opposition to Theodoric, brought the overthrow of his kingdom, defeated his dream, and scourged Europe with some unnecessary benighted centuries. It is one of the strangest stories in all history. Troubles brewed increasingly during the last years of Theodoric's life. There was a change in the ruler of the Eastern Empire. The Pope made a journey to Constantinople Theodoric believed the Pope and Emperor were conspiring against him, and whether or not his suspicion was justified, he naturally became bitterly resentful. Roman opposition became more open and unrest deepened. Theodoric's magnanimous justice and tolerance of a quarter of a century seemed cruelly unrewarded, and the old barbaric mood apparently returned upon him. Suspecting a plot, he caused certain of the Roman senators to be thrown into prison. Among them was Boethius, and because of this enraged act of Theodoric, we have that literary Bible, The Consolations of Philosophy, for Boethius wrote it during his imprisonment. Threatening clouds continued to gather, and in 526, sad and disappointed, anticipating the overthrow of his kingdom and defeat of his dream, Theodoric died. The ruin came quickly. In 14 years after the death of Theodoric, the kingdom was overwhelmed, there had come a new emperor in the Eastern Empire, Justinian, who codified Roman law. He sent his best general and took Ravenna. Thus came the ruin of Theodoric's kingdom and the defeat of his grandiose dream. Italy was quickly scourged in consequence. Within a few years, twice, the cruel Totila ravaged Rome. And after his second sack of the city in 549, the barbaric invader took away with him all the few remaining inhabitants. And for 40 days, Rome, a city of temples, homes, and palaces, was without a human wail or sob to break the awful silence, only the cry of a night bird or the howl of a beast of prey. You enter the forest along the Adriatic shore, brooding over this long past. Has accident then so great a part in human destiny? Can we achieve the tolerance, humanity, and brotherhood that may yet fulfill Theodoric's broken dream. Theodoric the Great, The Defeated Dream, has been the subject of this third program in the new NBC educational series titled Lives of Great Men, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author. 
Copies of last week's talk on Marcus Aurelius and tonight's discussion of Theodoric the Great may be obtained by addressing the National Broadcasting Company, Radio City, New York, or the station to which you are listening.